Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank uh, Jigo Alampai and his um, colleagues in organizing the TED uh, Diliman series of lectures and inviting me to be one of the speakers this uh, afternoon. It certainly is a great privilege uh, to be here. It's not often that an 83-year-old senior citizen <laughs> is asked to talk about the future since you always talk about the past. <laughs> so I uh, thank you, Jigo, for having faith in uh, senior citizens. But um, I thought I would talk about our future as a maritime power, because there's been so much news, you see, in the uh, dailies. Uh, I was hoping that Pinoy would beat uh, Hu Jintao in Vladivostok. But of course, as a big power, China had the power to say no. And we couldn't say, as a weak power, why not? <laughs> um, but I think it's good to go back to our past. And our past is really is our geography. Geography is our destiny. I'm sorry if I have sound a little bit like Freud, who of course he said biology is destiny, and the women hated him for it. And being a feminist, I found myself uh, protesting against the that is not exactly a Freudian slip, but really a, a Freudian principle. But he was partly right. So when I say destiny, it is a disadvantage or an advantage, depending on how you meet it. And I think that uh, geography is our destiny in the West Philippine Sea issue, and we should not forget this. We are a we are an archipelago, whether we like it or not. We are not a continent. So let us stop um, using cars, let us use boats, let us swim in the sea, not in swimming pools. And ladies, please don't use skin whiteners, because if you're by the sea, you're going to be dark. It's good to be kayumangi, what's wrong with that? So 80% of our territory is maritime. In other words, we're four-fifths water and only one-fifth land. I hope you realize that. Next, please. Now, let us take a look at our <clears throat> geographical situation. Notice how we are at the eastern fringe of the ASEAN countries. And really, in the, to the east, or we call it the Western Pacific, there is an unimpeded access all the way to Hawaii. And uh, then to the, in the West Philippine Sea, which now um, Pinoy has um, said is official, but when we say West Philippine Sea, it only means really that body of water where we claim our 200-mile exclusive economic zone. It does not uh, relate to the South China Sea that borders on Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia. I hope that that is clear. I think we are correct. We're only claiming the, uh, that part, uh, part of it is disputed, yes, but uh, we are not um, claiming what is not ours within the 200-mile exclusive economic zone. But notice how really isolated we are as an archipelago, but yet how we can unite the world if we only really became a real maritime power with enough uh, ships and airplanes and uh, seamen and, uh, and good, uh, uh, well, maritime leaders. Well, let us look at our um, <clears throat> resources. This is, I'm telling you what is public knowledge. The, these are the, some of the important issues. We are uh, the sixth world greatest producer of fish and 1.5 million of Filipinos depend on their livelihood. The West Philippine Sea, by the way, I'm from Pangasinan, uh, which I usually call the Texas of the Philippines. Uh, but, uh, uh, and this is why maybe I feel attached to the West Philippine Sea, because as a child, I grew up in the West Philippine Sea, literally. Uh, but notice the West Philippine Sea is the source of 25% of commercial fish supply in the country, seaweed, prawns, and fish. Tuna, of course. Well, we also have the Coral Triangle. Uh, the Philippines are part of the Coral Triangle, uh, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Solomon Islands. And here is the uh, uh, greatest uh, biodiversity of shore fish. 
uh, which is found on Grande Island, the center of the center of bio, uh, of marine shore fish biodiversity is. It really is between uh, Mindoro and Batangas. And um, those of you who have been to Anila, for instance, uh, should be happy uh, that you're so close to the center of the center of marine shore fish biodiversity. And this is not a, a it's more fun in the Philippines tourist uh, <laughs> slogan, but this has been uh, verified by scholars all over the world. And uh, so I think we may not have the Parthenon uh, or the Lincoln Shrine in, in Washington, but uh, let's not forget that we are at the center of the center of the marine shore fish di biodiversity. This has also been called the um, Coral Triangle, has been called the Amazon of the seas, you see. The Amazon of Brazil, for instance, is the largest uh, rainforest in the world. But we also don't have just the West Philippine Sea, we have also the Benham Rise, and uh, this is a plateau, uh, underground plateau, which has now been declared by the UN as really ours. We have no territorial dispute in this uh, part of our country, thank goodness, and uh, we, can, uh, we can exploit it if you wish to. Uh, this, is, this area of the Benham Rise is much larger, is one-fourth larger than the, than the entire island of Luzon. And underneath are uh, manganese, uh, no jewels. We could have really a steel, uh, a steel industry here. But of course, as you know, it's, it's one thing just to claim that we have this uh, legally, but it would take so much capital and also technology uh, to be able to do this. So uh, maybe I agree, although we train the best lawyers, maybe we should have fewer lawyers and more uh, underwater engineers who can explore uh, Benham Rise. Well, here are our petroleum prospects. And uh, if you can see, the Reed Bank is uh, the one, the most in, in, <clears throat> in, in dispute is the one closest to Palawan. That's Reed Bank and near Palawan. And here is the um, South China Sea platform. This is the uh, Vietnam area. But these are the petroleum prospects and competition is increasing in the area as foreign investors are beginning to realize that uh, this is the new area for um, <clears throat> prospecting. Uh, and this is why we have to move faster rather than be, be uh, taken up by uh, <clears throat> minute regulations on, on uh, administrative rules, etc., and put our own uh, investment house in order. Well, we also have the tidal and wave energy potentials. I mean, uh, when I was in the Senate, already this was being bruited around that we could have, uh, we could get uh, the energy from our tidal waves and uh, so many points. Of course, uh, San Bernardino Strait here, which separates uh, the Bicol Peninsula from Samar, is maybe the most important entry point for many of vessels coming in and out of our archipelago. But uh, uh, for those of you who are still uh, in their, uh, still aged 15 or 20s or just beginning your careers in the UP, please do something about knowing how to um, <clears throat> harness our tidal and wave uh, energies because during my time, all they could look for were Italian experts. And when I said, where are the Filipino experts? Well, uh, there really are none yet. So uh, this is maybe an area where uh, we, we could do things. But again, it takes a lot of capital and a lot of technology to be able to go into this type of energy. Uh, by the way, gigawatts, uh, I'm, not, I'm really an amateur, but I had like a good scholar, I had to look up what gigawatts means. That means 1,000 megawatts. Megawatts and kilowatts, I just know my electric bill with Meralco, so I only know kilowatts. <laughs> Well, but although geography is destiny, as I have said, that destiny has now been changed because of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And taking, talking about law, I mean, uh, the UP law has played a major part in um, formulating our position on the law of the sea. I really don't know whether Senator Tolentino Arturo was a graduate of the UP law. Can maybe somebody tell me? But uh, 
he was really the one who thought of the archipelagic doctrine. Uh, the reason why I feel a little attached to the Caracas Convention of 10 years was I was just <clears throat> an officer in the Department of Foreign Affairs and I used to be the one to sign the delegation list for, uh, for about five years every year uh, for our delegation to go to Caracas. But that was a stellar legal team we had. We had, of course, uh, Arturo Tolentino, Estilito Mendoza, uh, Jose Ingles, uh, who were part of that, of that team. But it was the Philippine delegation who fought for the archipelagic doctrine. And the archipelago, what is an archipelago? Well, there, here's uh, Jose Ingles going back to the past. That's Laura Baja, who's now retired. Uh, Alejandro Yanko is also dead. And of course, Arturo Tolentino. <laughs> and uh, well, that's the past, but they're part of the future. Don't forget that. And uh, there he is speaking at the United Nations General Assembly uh, at the third uh, UNCLOS. We were one of the first countries to ratify it. As you saw, the Philippines is very good in all of these ceremonial things. I think we ratified it in 1984. But we were one of the very last, last two minutes, Philippine style, last two minutes before the basketball ends, the basketball game ends. Last two minutes, we finally drew our baselines in 2009, two months before the deadline. Anyway, uh, we did it anyway. <laughs> and uh, well, this is the archipelagic principle, which I hope this audience will take to heart because uh, we sort of say, oh, those Philippine islands, you know, so far away from the rest of the world. But the baselines, we become a unified, uh, a unified whole and the waters between the islands which formerly were regarded by international law as open or international seas now become waters under the complete sovereignty of the Filipino people. Not, not exactly complete because what we have is really economic sovereignty. We, can, we don't have the legal because uh, this is what maybe China is saying but we do have the economic sovereignty. In this slide, this is, by the way, what he said before the Batasan, after we ratified the Convention of the Law of the Sea, an additional area of 141,800 square nautical miles inside the baselines that will be recognized by international law as Philippine waters equivalent to 45,351,050 hectares, etc. You see, so we have a total gain of 93 million plus hectares as a total gain in the waters under Philippine jurisdiction. So this is really what it means. This is what really the, the, the tussle, I would call it, I won't say conflict, between China and ourselves really means it's not just what is ours is ours, ladies and gentlemen. You better know the facts and figures behind that statement. All right. Well, here are the current boundaries and um, well you have here the extended continental shelf that's the uh, Benham rise this is now the regime of islands which we were going to claim in the um, baseline law of 2009 under uh, Republic Act um, 1922 uh, which amended the uh, Republic Act uh, 3046. But anyway, these, these are our treaty limits, the, this white area here. And the, this box is the, is, is Tess, uh, my, my advisor is here. Uh, Tess, what, what is this box now? These are the treaty limits, no? Yes. And the 200 mile exclusive economic zone is this now, which gives us as a part of, as a party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. All right, so what are we really quarreling about with China, or what is the dispute? 
Well, this is the Scarborough Shoal, which is about 200 kilometers plus away from Sambales. When I was a child in Pangasinan, I already heard about Masinlok Bay. It's not really abroad, it really is in our backyard. Masinlok is, is a mining town in Sambales, and uh, Bajo de Masinlok or Scarborough Shoal. And uh, here, here are the uh, Kalayan group of islands. It's about 200 kilometers plus away from Palawan. I have been there, and I suppose if you can go, uh, try to go, maybe it's more fun uh, on Kalayan. <laughs> Ask uh, if I were uh, Secretary Jimenez, I would maybe, with the permission of our Secretary of Defense, maybe try to find a helicopter that will not crash, <laughs> or a light aircraft that will not crash. Please check. <laughs> you never know in this country. And, uh, but notice how far it is from China, 800 plus kilometers. So, I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Please don't be so bamboozled by that super, that the peaceful rise of China as a superpower in the world. We've got to know what are our national interests. In diplomacy, as they say, we have no permanent friends, we have no permanent enemies, we have only permanent national interests. And this is part of our national interest that they should be so close to our own, own uh, baselines. You see, this is what is difficulty. I wanted to show to you the nine dash lines which China is claiming theirs. Again, there might be a scholar in the, in the audience. I don't know what is the date of this nine dash line, but is it before the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea? I haven't been able to find out. And what was the participation of China in the own clause? I never heard them, because that was the part when Mao Zedong was working so hard to consolidate his power within China itself. Did they have time to think international law at that time, which at that time we already could have? I don't know. Maybe these are some of the scholarly nuances, some of the scholarly refinements which have to be looked into in our dispute with China. But this is the nine dash line. Here it is. You go down here and down here. It is a nine dash line and up to Brunei. And uh, it does not show here. Here is Palawan here, part of the non, nine dash line. And here, uh, Bajo de Masinlok. This is Bajo de Masinlok, by the way. Now, these are the, it is outside the baselines, all right. But it is within our 200 mile exclusive economic zone. This, this is the Scarborough Shoal, right. And, um, well, before I, this is the non, nine dash line that's part of it. It's very hard to see it on this map. And it goes up to here, up to Taiwan. Now, what is the, the, the legal justification for that? I don't think they have said anything. The, the Chinese have said anything. So they want to discuss issues just on a bilateral basis. They don't want to go international because the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea is international. ASEAN is international. They just want to talk to us face to face. But as you know, Hu Jintao did not bother to see Pinoy in Vladivostok. So if they say we'll talk bilaterally, you can see that, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, there's protocol on both sides, so I don't want to be presumptuous about what happened, but the fact is, I think, as a small power, we have to cool our heels when the giant prefers not to say anything. Act 9522, where finally we had to draw our baselines uh, in accordance with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, because we had to make sure that our 200 mile exclusive economic zone would be drawn from the baselines. And uh, 
This was uh, passed in 2009, as you can see, just before the, uh, the, the, the deadline. Uh, but I believe it was also a um, manifestation on the part of government that uh, these issues did not matter too much. Just remember also that before we were able to draw these baselines, we had an agreement with China and Vietnam to do underground exploration, but within the Philippine 200-mile exclusive economic zone. So I think it's better that before we come into agreement uh, before with other powers, we know exactly uh, where we are. Well, the very contentious issue is really this regime of islands where you have Kalayaan uh, here. Uh, in the uh, Republic Act 9522, we do not include the, this regime of the Spratlys, if you want to call them that way, the Spratlys, as part of our baselines, but as a regime of islands in recognition of the fact that there are other islands here which are disputed or claimed by other uh, claimants. And although we have a, a, a claim on, on Kalayan, which is now a, a barangay of uh, Palawan, and where the Reed Bank, of course, is, uh, is located, uh, I, I believe that um, this, in a way, draws the 200-mile um, the exclusive economic zone and still uh, reminds the international community that we have not given up our claims on the regime of islands, which is uh, permitted under the law of the sea. Well, there again is Scarborough Shoal, um, and when I say geography is destiny, uh, notice that when uh, the most recent typhoon blew, the Philippine vessels left on the uh, premise that, um, oh, okay, I have to, have to end <laughs> on the premise that uh, um, we, well, uh, well, all right. Well, anyway, these are not the fishing vessels, uh, the Chinese vessels, which uh, claim now to have access to our uh, uh, waters. Uh, these are the giant clams, maybe some of the clams which uh, the uh, Marine Institute of the UP helped to develop. And uh, these are some of the sharks uh, also which uh, were caught in the Chinese vessels. Well, uh, th these, are the, uh, these are the Chinese vessels which have been cited. They are called CSM, Civilian Surveillance, Maritime Surveillance. But although they're civilians, they're also armed. So that's what uh, it means in Chinese. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's our capability gap. Anyway, I mean, you know, we're with the kolela as usual. <laughs> but uh, we're used to that, aren't we? But let's not make it a habit, please. Let's be winners for a change. <laughs> but look at Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. Look at China. So, naman tayo. But let's not also accept this as a rule of life, correct? Let's fight for something more respectable, okay? Okay. Okay, naval power comparison, People's Republic, wala tayong laban, no? But it's good for you to know the cold facts. All right. Um, uh, air defense, ang daming zero natin, okay? <laughs> Uh, pero don't be ashamed, there's always hope in the future, correct? This is what TED is all about, okay? <laughs> Let's go next, please. <laughs> well, this is uh, our two foreign ministers, Yang and Del Rosario, Hu Jintao and Pinoy, they didn't see each other. Peaceful resolution of conflict, but it does not mean that we Filipinos should not know how to engage China. We got to know what we have first before we go international. Go local, then think global, not the opposite place in foreign policy or in international relations when it comes to power. All right. In, in international relations, power is the language that speaks, not law. Okay, well, here is our Navy, here is our 
Uh, hukbo ng Republika Gregorio del Pilar. This is a, uh, we bought this from the Philippine, uh, from the American Coast Guard, but never mind, it will, we hope, will frighten the Chinese off, okay? <laughs> well, this is now the, the Navy, despite all of its uh, poor little budget, I assure you that there are men and women behind them who are working and who are patriots like all of us under this roof. Well, uh, these are the core values of the, of the Navy. It has a strategic sail plan because it knows that we are a maritime power. Four pillars of a naval power, of a naval leader, uh, physical, mental, moral, and spiritual. Well, there are also women, by the way, in the Navy, and the highest ranking is a captain, which means she commands a ship, but unfortunately we could not get her picture here. So ladies, please serve the Navy. All right, next please. So we have here also leaders who address, civilian leaders who dis, uh, address the Navy so that our military leaders will also be always sympathetic to the civilian, civilian power being supreme in our republic. And uh, right, and together we have to work together to preserve our strategic interests. And I mean we have all, there we have the if you really want to uh, engage China, we have to engage our future folk, our local communities, our coastal communities, local government, civil society, the military, and the national government. So we don't have to be scared because I believe that we do have international law on our sides, but we have to work very hard to match those rights with actual capability, commitment, and patriotism. Thank you very much.